The Nintendo Switch is into its third year and is as stronger than ever, breaking sales record numbers everywhere. Whether you love the first party franchises, the arcade shooters, the brawlers, the action adventure games and of course the RPGs, the system has everything you need. Coupled with very strong eShop and solid indie game titles, the Switch has undoubtedly been a game changer. But it's 2020 and questions about its technical ability continue to be asked. As we see more remasters, remakes and ports to the system, can the Nintendo Switch truly keep up? With the new Americo revision systems, is it time for Nintendo to allow developers to take more advantage of overclocking techniques to help with performance? Or is it time for a refresh of the hardware that opens up some additional power? As always, I'm going to attempt to answer this by providing technical analysis on the newest batch of recent titles, all recent 2020 releases, but of course, I want to hear people's thoughts and opinions in the comments below. First up, let's start with Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, a great modern update to the classic RPG for the Nintendo Wii. It's been received extremely well by the media, and of course fans of JRPGs are in for a real treat. But the game has come under fire for its heavy use of dynamic resolution that particularly has an impact in handheld mode. For the game, Monolith Soft once again used the Tauna engine that hosted Xenoblade Chronicles 2 on the Nintendo Switch. The game, which is excellent, had trouble with resolution and would often drop to sub 400p in handheld mode. But that was 2017, and you could give graphical fidelity a pass. Developers were still learning about the hardware. Fast forward to today, and yet we see the almost exact same results with Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. That is, in docked mode, we see a resolution from 504p to 720p at 30 frames per second, and undocked, a dismal 378p to 540p. Known as Resolution Gate, it caused some concern in the community, but in reality, how bad is this? Monolith focused on smooth frame rates at the cost of resolution so the game could run at 30 frames per second. But why can't we have both? 30 frames per second on a crisp 540p or 720p experience. Surely the Switch can manage this. One of the biggest counter arguments I heard was that 378p was only hit about 5% of the time in the game. But in my experience with the game so far, playing about 4 or 5 hours into it, I would say that number is actually higher. So let's take a look at some things. First, in docked mode, the game looks decent, but it doesn't appear to be hitting 720p. It's nice and clean, but you can notice some resolution drops when the action gets busy. Overall, I think most people will be satisfied with the game in docked mode. While the low end is 504p, so far I've not seen it drop to that low. Of course, it's an easy 100 hour plus game, so it's likely to occur at some point. Handheld mode, on the other hand, is not so forgiving. The resolution window is 378p to 540p. The TAA filter in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is present here, but it's been tweaked to be not as aggressive. But the biggest problem is that the dynamic resolution swapping occurs so frequently. Not only is there a cost associated with this switch, which causes the frame rate to hiccup, it can actually get quite distracting. Witness this cutscene here played in handheld mode. You can notice the resolution switches in the background. This type of effect is quite common as you play through the game. So, is there anything that can be done to improve visuals and stop the resolution from bouncing around so frequently? The answer is yes. With access to overclocking tools and a configuration file modification, we can clean up the graphical fidelity. Data miners found the configuration file for the game, which allows for different options to be changed. By completely disabling TMAA, but keeping the AA enabled, in my opinion, provides a cleaner image overall. However, it's not perfect. Notice the artifacting in things like the trees, something that's also present in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. But what about overclocking? In handheld mode, by simply boosting GPU clocks from 307 to 460 MHz, the game hits 540p much more, and also provides smoother frame rates because the resolution isn't swapping as much. Now this is a generous increase in the GPU clocks, but notice it's only a smaller increase in fan speed and temperatures. In docked mode, the same thing applies. Boosting the GPU from 768 to 900 MHz will bump the resolution to 720p most of the time. So what is the takeaway here? Is Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition a bad port or limitations of hardware? Well, it's a little bit of both in my opinion. 
One of the difficulties in developing titles on the Switch is that you need to consider two profiles. It's essentially like trying to target a PS4 and a PS4 Pro, but the problem with the Switch development tends to favour either handheld or docked mode. In a recent SDK update last year, Nintendo introduced CPU boost mode, which can uncap the CPU clock speed and max it out to around 1.7 GHz. This boost mode is geared towards speeding up loading times where the focus is on the CPU. Nintendo has also added a third portable profile that allows for a GPU clock of 460 MHz, but as of the making of this video, only a handful of titles use this profile. While it is available for all developers to access if they so choose, as to why only a few games ever use this mode seems a little strange. Perhaps it's because of the increase in battery consumption or possibly due to some heat or stability issues, but this seems unlikely. The newer Tegra X1 Mariko revision runs cooler and longer on the same battery. So ideally, it would be nice to see Nintendo consider providing an option for programmers to adjust both the CPU and GPU clocks with some more control. But this is just one game. Let's consider a few others. Virtuos on May 29th also released two games for the Nintendo Switch, the Bioshock Collection, as well as XCOM 2. First impressions here are very positive. The games themselves look great and run very well. Looking at Bioshock, the target here is to keep frame rates as smooth as possible at 30 frames per second, and testing out Bioshock 1, 2 and Infinite, other than some hiccups here and there, the game stays true to this number. As expected in handheld mode, if we can bear Bioshock 1, you can see the visible drop in resolution with the image appearing quite pixelated. Normally, some type of smoothing is applied for lower resolution Switch games, so this is an interesting take, and one that I applaud Virtuos for. The Vaseline effect as it's known in some handheld games is not apparent here. But my biggest concern with the Bioshock collection is that these ports aren't anything special. Essentially, they look and run exactly the same as the Xbox 360 versions, which don't forget is a console that was released in 2005. The Switch version docked runs at 720p and handheld it drops to 540p. Now this isn't to take away from excellent work that Virtuous has made on these ports. It's really there to illustrate potential areas where Switch technology is struggling to keep up by providing the ability for developers to control clock speeds in a meaningful way, in Bioshock's case, boosting GPU clocks could see the game scale to 1080p in docked and 720p in handheld mode, which is a clear step up from the 360 and the PS3 versions. Or perhaps with a CPU boost and uncapping the frame rate and seeing if it's possible to push 60 frames per second at a slightly lower resolution. Bioshock Infinite in particular contains some notable graphical downgrades. For example, the god rays in the introduction section here or the reflections in the water are notably lower resolution. The other Virtuos game, XCOM 2, is also interesting from a porting perspective. The game once again runs at 720p in docked mode and 540p in handheld mode, and it maintains roughly 30 frames per second with some frame drops of course. But it's clear once again that sacrifices were made to this game. XCOM 2 demands a powerful CPU to run. So for the Switch port for example, we can see the lower resolution textures, the destruction animations are mostly missing, and the low res shadow maps and there are no specific switch enhancements, such as touch controls. But overall, this is XCOM 2 running on a handheld system, and in handheld mode, you'll barely notice that the game has significantly downgraded visuals anyway. Another game that I'm interested to take a closer look at from an overclocking perspective has to be Platinum Games' The Wonderful 101 Remastered. Targeting 60 frames per second at 1080p in docked mode, the game never quite gets there. As a port, there is absolutely nothing wrong with this game at all. However, the performance leaves much to be desired, with wildly fluctuating frame rates that on occasion can dip into the 30s, and in some instances can dip below the same level of performance as the Wii U original. But by accessing overclocking on the Nintendo Switch, the GPU and CPU in docked mode, the game can hit 60 frames per second. With many Xbox 360 and PS3 era games making their way across to the Switch, most of them run at a decent level of performance, although there are some sacrifices that were made. But how much longer can the Switch be a viable system for ports? With the next generation just around the corner, although the Nintendo Switch is technically equipped 
to handle current generation titles, the challenge is then put back onto the studios. Are these studios prepared to make the appropriate investment for these games to run on the Nintendo Switch? And does this investment turn into a profit once the game is ultimately released? If we read the technology challenges that both Virtuos and Sabre Interactive discussed with the porting process, it was mostly due to the Switch's main memory at 4GB with only 3.2 available. But this memory is unified and shared between code, data and the GPU. So it's implied that more main memory means more access to GPU as well. However, if we consider a new revision switch with more onboard RAM, I don't think that's something that would occur. A mid-season refresh of switch hardware with more RAM doesn't make much sense. But while I do think the switch has three good years left in it, I do question if the ports will become more difficult and more of an uphill battle than we've seen due to the challenges faced. Ultimately, what I'd like to see is Nintendo continue to relax some of the overclocking features of the Nintendo Switch. Specifically, when the Switch needs to apply dynamic resolutions to keep the frame rate in order, provide developers with the option to dynamically adjust GPU clock speeds. As we've seen with some of the overclocking tests, these increases can help games look and run smoother. We've heard from Virtuos and Sabre Interactive talking about how pretty much anything is possible on the Switch. And yes, I believe that to be the case as well. But how long will it be before the current generation ports to the Switch really start to struggle without some technical help? Will Nintendo provide some type of mid-season or mid-iteration refresh of the Switch hardware that opens up some more performance and power like we saw maybe with the Nintendo new 3DS which had additional power underneath the hood will we see something similar with the Nintendo Switch? That does remain to be seen, but I think if existing ports to the Switch need to work in a appropriate way, then Nintendo really must consider providing developers with a little more additional power to get those ports over the line. But I definitely wanna hear your thoughts in the comments below. What do you think about this topic? I'm very interested to hear what people say about this stuff. Do you think that the Switch is going to be fine for the next three years without any iteration whatsoever? Do you think it needs some help to get some of these current gen ports over the line? I want to hear your thoughts down below. Well, guys, that will do it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.